So, hi everyone, and welcome to the talk by Fiona Wood. My name is Leah, and I'm co director of Catalyst Arts. And we're delighted to be bringing you this talk this evening as part of our Common Eye Garden program. Um, Common Eye Garden is an exhibition and associated program which explores the common collaboration and collective action. The exhibition includes work by Chris Alton, Jerome Bell, Emmett Brown, Aidan Wall, and a Zoom library created by Bloomers. And the public program has included contributions from Chris Alton, Dirty Book, Bloomers, Just Book, and this evening, Fiona Wood. Um, Fiona Wood is a visual artist, PhD researcher, and educator whose work explores ideas of what we have in common. So Fiona is going to talk to us this evening about her work and her research on the relationship between commoning and aesthetic work. Um, if anyone has any questions, there'll be some time at the end uh, to ask them or feel free to pop them in the chat. And uh, Fiona, if you're ready, I'll pass over to you. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, Okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Um, okay, so one second. Um, sorry, just. Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on talking about my practice specifically in relation to the commons um, which is the is the sort of subject of my most recent work but it also goes back to um, some quite old work now and I thought I would show a little bit of that just um, as a way to kind of um, maybe talk through how I uh, how my approach to the commons my understanding and my approach to the commons as a political form has changed um, so I came to the Commons through work I was doing in the early 2000s and um, I, I produced a project for five years about art in rural contexts and um, I was doing a lot of research around um, radical rural movements and so I came across the, the diggers um, who are also known as the, uh, the true levellers and they were um, they were they were part of a kind of a an, uh, it was quite a sort of rebellion went on in England in the 17th century in particular against the enclosures movement and um, just in case anybody's not familiar with it um, the enclosures movement was a legal process in England it went back as far as the 14th century but it got particularly bad in the 17th century and what literally what happened was um, that the common land which had been communally used by the peasantry started to be enclosed by the land owning classes um, and they used force and they used uh, the kind of legal machinery that they controlled uh, to carry out enclosure and so much of the peasantry was left landless um, and driven into poverty and you know cheap became a cheap labour force so there was a lot of agitation uh, going on and one of the groups was the True Levellers, and they were uh, really interesting. They're considered to be one of the precursors to modern anarchism. They um, they were very much associated with a kind of agrarian socialism, um, and they they advocated things like economic equality. Uh, they tried to reform the existing social order with these sort of small agrarian communities. Um, they uh, also advocated for an early public health system, actually, which is really interesting and a communal ownership opposed, as opposed to you know, individual ownership. And the, the leader of the movement was called Gerard Wynne Stanley. And um, one of the reasons that their, their, their legacy has survived so much is because Wynne Stanley was very active in publishing pamphlets. Um, and he published a large number, including on the right-hand slide of the slide, there is, is the Diggers Manifesto. Uh, what's well, called the True Levellers uh, Manifesto, actually. They became known as the diggers because they started to dig and plant common land um, and they encouraged other people to do so as well. So 
within the space of a few years, there were actually at least nine digger colonies in the southeast of England, but they were subjected to, you know, a lot of brutality and um, arson and things like that. You can see it in this um, graphic here, you know, the houses on fire and the, of course, the landed gentry could afford these kind of private armies to drive people off. Um, so one of the other things, when Stanley's writings were very broad ranging and he uh, also envisaged uh, a kind of ecological interrelationship between humans and nature and the idea of extending the commons beyond, you know, just a sort of human uh, society, social, you know, form. So um, this, this is work, uh, this is quite old now, but um, this is the first work that I did that really engaged with uh, the idea of the commons and I was very much thinking about that kind of ecological interrelationship um, at that time and often when I'm at the start of a project I do these kind of performative photographic works because it's a way of sort of engaging emotionally with an idea you know kind of really puts me into uh, into the into the, the subject that I'm trying to engage with. Um, but generally, I would say that my practice begins when I start, when I put these things to work, you know, when I set them to work, um, which is kind of how I think about what I do. And so one of those um, images became a, a poster. This is actually in Turkish because it was a print on demand um, situation and I was printing them in different languages. And what I did was I um, distributed them amongst my own kind of personal network and, you know, friends and colleagues and friends of friends and all that. But they were also, um, uh, they were available at different kinds of public events. And so the request was that people would take a poster and they would put it up and send me back um, an image. And really, I guess what one of the things that was happening was it was kind of like a mapping of how an idea spreads, you know, mapping also kind of the idea of a network of solidarity and um, just kind of make giving that a sort of a degree of visibility in a way. Um, this is just a selection of the images um, that I got. Back. Often what I'm doing is generating circulation and distribution. That's often the kind of at the core of what I'm what I'm doing. So. Um, uh, this is one of the events. Um, the, the poster was part of a, a larger project called Collection of Minds, uh, which was commissioned for a European research project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so I commissioned posters from uh, two other people. One was Fernando Garcia Dori, who's a Spanish artist, and the other was Eche Sarius, who's a, a Turkish architect. And uh, they also produced zines. We all produced zines. And then these were um, distributed, as I said, in different ways through these kinds of public events. Um, it was included in the something called the Rhizomatic Library in the Venice Biennale of Architecture. I'm trying to remember which year it is, 2009 or 10 or one of those years. Um, so, so there was all these different kinds of ways in which this work traveled, you know. Um, and then, kind of over the following years, sometimes the, these works would find um, an outlet in, you know, so different kinds of public situations. And public has often been a circuit that I've used for, um, for the distribution of, you know, work and ideas. That's another one. So, um, so this is a graph around, or this is a graph of uh, kind of looking at the commons along these different axes of material, immaterial, and inherited and produced. And the work I just showed you in terms of its kind of content, um, I suppose it was very much situated in that idea of the material inherited commons, you know, looking at planetary life support systems and the kind of common ground between, you know, the human and the non-human. But um, although I didn't articulate it like this at the time, I think with the, with the kind of setting it in motion with the production of the, um, those circuits, it was really about starting to explore a social commons, you know, the idea of generating an infrastructure uh, of solidarity and of um, you know, the sharing of ideas. Um, and this was, uh, this is just a screen, couple of screenshots from this European project, Rhizome, which uh, I was part of at the time. And it was a very extensive project that happened across, uh, we did work in Romania and France and Germany. And it was this really, really interesting collection of people, most of whom were architects, socially engaged, 
or radical architects, which was super interesting for me because it really opened my eyes to a kind of different way of thinking about the work. Um, what, for one thing, they're just like very, very practical. You know, they, they, um, they would just engage sort of very quickly with the idea of producing infrastructures, infrastructures for commoning. Um, and uh, sorry, just let me keep myself on track here. Um, yeah, and so for, for these groups, common the commons is very much an action concept, you know, and uh, they were very focused on this idea of a kind of ecosystem of value, uh, which is one of the really important things about the commons as an emerging social movement is this sense of this ecosystem of value. So this is Public Works, which is an art and architecture group um, who were part of Rhizome. And this is a uh, work that they started to do in Loughborough Junction in, uh, I think it's in London. Um, here you can see there's there's a like a community garden, the Loughborough Community Garden, and they uh, were the site was going to be developed for private, you know, use by the council. So they they invited Public Works in, and they worked together uh, over a number of years, um, up to the point where they are it's now become a social enterprise called meanwhile space and they negotiated with the council and so they they've actually um you know they're producing these uh shared kind of spaces um uh, co-working spaces and so on and so this is in a way what they've done is they've produced a commons they've produced a resource that can be used in common or they've they've added to a commons that was already there in the kind of the garden um they've expanded it and opened it out to different kinds of activities um, this is also um, public works and they are, this is an ongoing work called the School for Civic Action. And public works are, they're kind of typical of the, the practices that I'm really interested in and really like, you know. So um, they, this is a, uh, the School for Civic Action is like, um, it's like an immaterial commons that they bring to maybe other works that they're doing, other kinds of projects, or, you know, they kind of, add this value to um, material commoning practices. And I think one of the things that's really relevant about that is that the commons is both a world making and a knowledge making project of operating together. And again, that's really important in terms of this idea of an ecosystem of value, you know, that, that is kind of operating at these different registers that are interacting uh, with each other. I don't think it's um, any secret to say that, you know, the current uh, regime of value really awards extractive production and consumption activities. Um, and things like, you know, the free labor um, of digital workers, the um, non-recognition of care work, obviously the ongoing ecological destruction. And um, these things are all linked to a system based on extractivism. Um, and in conditions where, the infrastructures that are necessary to maintain communities uh, are, are broken, I think, essentially. Um, rather than trying to repair those structures, uh, which were set up to re reproduce inequality in the first place, um, there, it actually sort of presents an opportunity to develop new kinds of structures and infrastructures. And that is very much what's happening in the contemporary social movement of the commons, which is really well organized and really well established it's quite you know they're quite far along in terms of um, generating systems and templates and models that can be applied at sort of everything from a micro scale right up to the macro scale which is what's necessary if this is going to be more than just a sort of symbolic set of actions you know to actually make this work um the commons so peer-to-peer -peer, the peer-to-peer -peer foundation um, if people haven't come across it yet, it's uh, kind of like an umbrella organization for a lot of commonsing projects that are happening, commoning projects. And um, they do a lot of work kind of generating uh, theoretical materials, also kind of useful models, um, things like uh, usable contracts um, for kind of um, commons based peer production kind of uh, works. Um, and also kind of pedagogical materials just around like what is the commons, you know, so, so these very straightforward um, and simple graphics are also part of what they do. And they define the commons as a resource plus the community that shares the resource um, 
and a set of rules to care for both the resource and the community. And if any one of those things are missing, then it's not it's not a commons. You know, it needs that set of kind of rules to to protect everything. Um, the other thing is, as it says there at the top on the right, there is no commons without commoning. And so it's a little bit like di direct democracy. You know, it demands a lot of work and a lot of commitment. And it's, um, it's not like it's produced and then it just runs itself. It, it has to be maintained. And uh, uh, it's part of a sort of social system as well. You know, the, the kind of um, collective uh, production and management of, of the resource. Um, so this is from the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, and they they really say, as it says there in the, at the bottom, uh, that capitalism is beset by structural crises, and as a result of that, this new mode of production is already emerging, um, the idea of commons-based peer production. Um, and if you look at the commons transition movement, um, it's again very, very advanced, um, like there are whole cities doing this, like Melbourne in Australia has a commons transition project. But it also is obviously happening at a little micro scale. And I think that probably that's one of the things that interests me so much about the commons is that um, every act of commoning is generating its own little revolution. You know, we don't have to wait for the revolution to come to create the conditions. It's like it's imminent to the problematic structures. You know, we, we can begin anywhere at, at any kind of scale and any kind of act of commoning or any infrastructure of commoning contributes in a way to, to this larger movement so um so that's one of the things that i find very hopeful and um kind of promising about this as a social form and again like i said there there's really well established models so this is a, a foundation called inspiral it's actually a new zealand based foundation and they work with enterprises that are values based rather than profit profit driven and what they do is um they have these three kind of areas so um small enterprises often they might have money at one period of the year but not at another and um, whereas another value-based enterprise might be the other way around so what they do is they pool their uh, money up to a certain point and then they kind of co-budget you know so everybody has a more even kind of income throughout the year they also make it possible for people to um i think maybe borrow uh, or or maybe extend their uh, their access at a certain time uh, they share power. They use this really interesting platform called Lumio for collective decision making. And then they have an open source um, information and kind of um, resources available to people who are interested in, in working in the same way. So those are all kind of um, examples of uh, how a, a contemporary commons project kind of looks and how it, how it operates and functions. The other thing is that the Peer to Peer Foundation is really working at a real macro scale with this, like looking at they are developing what a legal system of the commons might look like um, with legal scholars and um, practitioners as well. And thinking through things like assemblies and, um, uh, you know, partnering with, there's, you know, can't be done without partnering with state organizations, at least in the beginning. Um, I mean, the Commons is a broad spectrum. You know, you have people who are very radical at one end of it um, and kind of at the anarchist level of the Commons, and it goes all the way across to a much more cooperative idea. Um, but maybe that's just, you know, that's where we're at really at the moment. So it, it, it's kind of um, just how things are working. <laughs> and it is, it does mean it's working. So yeah, again, one of the things that I think is so interesting is that, you know, it, it again does work from the micro scale up to the like super macro scale and it's happening it's not a, it's not a, um it's not an aspirational thing it's actually happening so this is a, another little graphic from the um peer to peer and they uh, again thinking about how this ecosystem of value creation works they describe three great spheres of social life um civil society economic society and political society but i would add to that a fourth one which is the idea of poetic society um which by which i mean uh bringing meaning into being through making that's, that's sort of a slightly crude idea of what um poetic represents but that's that's just how i'm using it in this context and it's it's about this idea of adding meaning to to the um to the ecosystem of value production you know meaning making is is really significant it's not kind of a by byproduct or something if you like so one of the ways that that is is done is through aesthetics and 
aesthetics is such a complex term and controversial really um I mean, I've written a whole chapter on aesthetics in my PhD, so I have to try and encapsulate it into one half sentence. And this is how I would do it. I say that aesthetics is about what we sense and how we make sense of it. And I think oftentimes we have this idea that what we sense is like natural. You know, it's not it's not shaped ideologically because we have this architecture, you know, the sensory architecture. But that's actually not correct because, um, you know, certain kinds of sense. Uh, Sense, forms of sensing are kind of prioritized or, or disregarded or uh, degraded or whatever by the societies that we live in. And so um, every society is underpinned by an aesthetic system. And uh, so to change that, even, as, even in little micro scales, to begin to change that aesthetic system is an important part of shifting the paradigm. So these are, these are my ways of thinking through what is it that aesthetic work um, or artistic work you know, brings to the commons, um, you know, in a real and, and meaningful and contributory way. So that brings me to um, the work, um, I suppose the, the main work I'm going to talk about, which is the Laboratory of Common Interest, which is actually nearly two years ago now, I can't believe it. Um, formerly it was described as, as a year-long work um, that culminated in this 13-day event space in Limerick. Uh, in, it was in the Fab Lab in Limerick. I deliberately wanted it to be in a maker space rather than an art space. Um, but really the genesis of the work is much longer and it sort of continues to, to operate today in you know, different form under a different name perhaps. The primary idea behind it was to create an infrastructure that would support the formation of a critical community of practice um, through various processes, you know, dialogical, material, poetic uh, and choreographic. I'll talk about that as well. So the processes leading up to the event space consist, consisted of round table uh, discussions, workshops, um, conversations, one-to-one -one conversations, uh, screening and discussion events, making projects, mapping projects. And through those sort of, through those events, um, a group of people kind of constellated around the idea. Uh, and they came to constitute a critical community who were very involved in the production of the laboratory um, over the course of the year prior to it and during the event space in particular. Um, so there were different registers to this project. It, it operated in um, a phenomenological register, by which I mean, um, you know, it took place in real time. It had its own kind of logics and material configurations. It was shaped by encounters and interactions that took place and uh, all of which sort of operate independently of any kind of central organizing logic. You know, it's when the work takes on its own um, force and its own form and begins to, you know, do whatever it's gonna do. Um, and then, so I'm just gonna run through these, I guess this is, it's, it's not really possible to talk about the whole project um, or even to extract an event from it is, is difficult because everything was kind of interconnected. So this is just to give you a little bit of a flavor. I should just say about this slide. So the, the event space was deliberately designed to coincide with the centenary of the Limerick Soviet, um, which was a 12 day occupation by the workers of Limerick um, against British militarism and also capitalist oppression. And um, they ran the city, um, you know, they had committees and they even had a currency, they had a food distribution system. So um, this was the event that was probably most closely connected with the, the committee who organized the, the centenary, um, I mean, it says festival, but it wasn't a festival in that, that sort of spectacular, you know, um, it was it was um it was also very ad hoc it was organized by uh, activists and uh, trade unionists and um all kinds of people really so anyway this is joe harrington here in the picture and joe and mary o'donnell are really uh, incredible activists from the 70s and 80s uh, and a little bit in the 90s they ran a a, a labor magazine called the bottom dog uh, which is uh, just an extraordinarily radical publication um, and Joe Harrington's been collecting this posters, uh, protest posters since the 70s. So he brought his archive to the laboratory 
and uh, we put up as many of them as we could and then he, he himself and Mary O'Donnell actually talked about their activism and their politics uh, over that time so it's it just um, it's just one of the places where the laboratory really came very close to what the rest of the kind of uh, Limerick Soviet Centenary Committee were doing. There's so many good things to say about these projects but anyway I haven't got time so I'm just gonna gonna keep going. Um, so um, yeah, so this is just a, a kind of a visual timetable of, of the events that happened. There were 18 events that happened during the 13 days, plus there were four uh, additional projects that kind of ran in parallel or overlapped with, or you know, were, were in different ways connected with the laboratory. This is um, this is a, a diagram that I've done to analyze the um, sort of relational infrastructure. This very basic diagram, because it really just looks at the relations based on the idea of usership and uh, production. And the relations were much more complex than that. But um, so these are the events here uh, around the sides. Uh, this is the core group who are really involved in the project over a long period of time. Uh, down here we have the co-producers. So these were people who got involved in actually producing co-producing events. They maybe weren't, they weren't involved with the project over a long time, but they came in for those 13 days and they organized events. And some people were invited and some people asked if they could uh, join or do works. And um, some people used the space kind of for their own uh, to do things that they had wanted to do anyway. And then down here, this is actually not finished yet. These are uh, people who sort of participated in the, in the project. Um, so I'm working on these sort of whole series of diagrams. Obviously, this is a slightly more nuanced um, diagram, trying to look at the ecosystem of the of the work. And um, this one, this particular one, includes the institutions. There were four major institutions, and three of them were educational. That all kind of fed into the work or supported it indirectly in in different ways. Um, it also includes small cultural spaces in Limerick. Um, and then different kinds of relations are being mapped. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, this one, when I'm still working on, I'm still working out what the ecosystem looked like. Uh, and I'm coming at it from different angles. So different diagrams are kind of taking up different aspects of, of that ecosystem. So um, the second register of the, of the work is really around this, like, this kind of infrastructural um, register and um, some of which was relational which I've just talked about. Um, sorry just let me get back to where I'm going. Okay so the, the way that my role um, was kind of to generate as I saw it anyway was to generate uh, an infrastructure which was conceptual, aesthetical and material and uh, within which um, sort of embodied forms of sense making could be enacted collectively. So that was kind of the task that I set myself uh, in terms of, of this work. And that included setting up um, a set of material um, material architectures as well um, in the form of these, these objects um, that I had made. Uh, this is the space, this is the Fab Lab space. Um, it was a slightly awkward space to use and so it needed to be, um, it needed objects within it to um, change the configuration of the space to, you know, depending on the activities that were happening. Um, the, there's a Catalan philosopher, Marina Garces, uh, who has argued that one of the key problems in our world is how to enact the common. It's all very well to talk about it, but how to enact it um, and how to experience what she calls the we and the world that is amongst us as a basis for modes of acting, acting together. Um, and as I think I've mentioned already, part of my research has been thinking about this idea of an aesthetics of the commons, you know, what that might look like, how it might be conceived and enacted contrary to this culture and regime of extractivism. Um, the problem with the, with the visual is that it's so easily co-opted by the spectacle, you know, by the extractivist regime, it's so easily incorporated into that particular value system. And so I, I deliberately focused on the idea of the haptic uh, rather than the visual and also on the relational, obviously. Um, and it led me to the idea of the, of the choreographic, uh, which is the idea of a choreography without a choreographer, if you like. And um, it's, it, it's kind of an expanded idea of, 
of choreography as a form of potential organization and instigation of action-based knowledge. Um, and it's a way of bringing meaning into being through the kind of, it's imminent to the, the way the bodies space themselves, uh, you know, around objects and structures and in relation to structures. And it involves kind of clusters and points of connection and voids and, and things like that. So it's, kind, it's quite a spatial, but also a relational way of thinking about the poetics of the work. You know, how did, how did meaning come into being in this, in this kind of work? Um, the other thing that I sort of borrowed from, from the choreographic is the idea of real-time composition. Uh, and so the laboratory of common interest was a real-time composition um, that was happening, you know, live as it were. Um, Shannon Jackson, who's a theorist of um, socially engaged work, she has said that um, socially engaged art borrows from the theatrical in all kinds of ways, you know, borrows practices and approaches and kind of modes of um, setting things up and relating but not doesn't necessarily acknowledge it or doesn't certainly doesn't like to be associated with the theatrical and I think the same is true of the choreographic I think it's really clear that there's there's kind of choreographic um, processes at work in socially engaged art so in some ways I, I felt also like I was just kind of foregrounding something that was in the work anyway and just to kind of think about what did that mean you know how how did it signify for uh, uh, an aesthetics of the commons. Um, I mean, these things are kind of internal to the logic of the project. In a way, nobody really needs to know this, but because I'm, I'm sort of sharing with you how the, the inner workings of the project, I guess I'm just, I'm just sharing that with you. Um, so as I mentioned, these, um, I made this series of objects. So there was this large, um, this was a blackboard table, but it also functioned as a, a, an object in the space. There were these standing double-sided blackboards. Um, this was a display table that was used to sort of incorporate things that were happening outside the physical space, but that were relevant to the, to the work. Um, there was this daily log. Uh, so uh, we gathered materials from every day so people could sort of follow what had been happening on previous days. Um, there was a zine library and uh, a number of artists contributed really brilliant zines um, that really brought an interesting dimension into the work, this little kind of reading space. And then this is again, just a really, um, just pulled out a number of images to try and um, sort of show how these objects were used in this sense of like, a, uh, it's almost like setting up a scenography, if you like, for a choreography, because the choreography, the other thing about it is, um, I said, it's not a, not something that is choreographed as such. Um, it's like putting, putting, uh, putting something in place and then the choreography itself was collective. It was something that just happened. Uh, it took the shape that it took. And so again, that was really interesting to, to see that kind of collective production uh, organizing itself and emerging uh, in response to um, the configuration of the space, not just, not just sort of materially, but in terms of the, the event that the co-producer was organizing whatever kind of event that was. So you can probably just see here just some of the different ways that the objects were used to kind of uh, configure this space. Oh yeah, and this is a, this is a diagram that I did um, just looking at the these choreographic objects. It's a term I borrowed from a, a famous choreographer called William Forsyth. Um, so the diagram just shows the number of events that the items were used for. Um, and then I, I sort of did a, a kind of mapping of the specific kind of uses of the space around these objects and then they're just superimposed. So I, I just like the way that this captures a, a kind of dynamic that happened over the course of this 18 days. You know, it's like a, a production in common, if you like. Um, it's just trying to give that a sort of a form through the diagrammatic, this idea of sort of bringing meaning into being, you know. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, okay, um, so uh, I mentioned that it was um, connected with the, it was coinciding with the, the Limerick Soviet centenary, and this is the program on the left. And um, as part of that, uh, I worked with an artist, Kieran Nash, um, on the production of a project. It's really, it was really Kieran's production, or project, sorry, and I was in a kind of supporting role. Um, and Kieran is here and he is going to, um, actually he's going to spend 10 minutes talking about this, this aspect of the work. So um, I'm going to hand over to you, Kieran. Thanks, Fiona. Turn off my... 
Um, I think you're being far too generous there. <laughs> it was very much a collaboration, I think, with a lot of people involved. Um, sure. So you approached me um, to ask what I'd like to do for the Laboratory of Common Interest, um, I suppose, in the context of the April 19 uh, Limerick Soviet centenary. Um, and yeah, I'd been working with you previously um, as an undergraduate, um, exploring economic systems and um, I suppose different modes of value and currency, um, particularly um, around enacting solidarity with communities and whatnot. Um, so we said, why not make money? <laughs> and um, we approached the um, the, the Limerick Soviet Centenary Committee and we had many um, discussion groups with them and with uh, members of the public and with um, um, more people with expert opinion um, as to what we might actually do. Um, so I guess it coalesced into us either doing an open call, uh, which I felt that would have been a, a much larger project, but um, given the time scope that we left ourselves in the end, we, we left it at a, a closed call. Uh, so we uh, put out um, a closed brief to um, six uh, artists that we um, thought their work would, would lend well to such a project. Um, sorry, I just want to name the artists. Uh, so we had Olivia Fury, um, James Kearney, Jim Furlong. Um, I ended up doing one. <laughs> I can't remember. Did some? Did we approach somebody and they couldn't do it? And uh, Tom Prendergast. Um, oh, and Kerry Guinan, if I haven't mentioned her. Um, so yeah, we approached um, a designer in Limerick, Victoria Burnetta, um, who. I think was involved in a talk here with Catalyst Arts recently. She collaborates with um, uh, Kate O'Shea in the Dirty Books project. And I don't think we could have gotten anybody else to do it. Um, and she produced these beautiful um, artworks because uh, that's what we see them as. And it was a very um, poetic act to have them in circulation in the city during the 1919 centenary um, as a commemoration to the striking workers who produced their own currency, which allowed them to step outside the, um, I suppose, the, the control of the, the, the regime existing in their time. Um, and one thing that really struck me about this project was the, um, histories and the stories that it uh, invigorated and uh, kind of prompted people to share and um, the amount of support from different businesses around the community from even like the likes of SIP2 and whatnot, um, local shop owners. Um, yeah, I think in all we produced, I think I had some figures, sorry. Yeah, we. We reckon that at one stage we did a tally, um, I'd say that we're no accountants anyway. <laughs> well, I'm not anyway. Uh, we had 2,340 shillings distributed and 2,010 shillings sold at one stage we tallied it at. We had, um, I think, I have a figure here, nine, but I think it was definitely about a dozen businesses around the city involved in it. Um, we had four major points of sale, the Limerick Urban Co-op, um, Lucky Lane, um, the commercial bar in Limerick and the Celtic bookshop were our, our points of sale where people could go and purchase and the shillings were um, collected all over the world. Um, we had people from Spain, Italy, Canada, the US, the UK. So people really kind of like exploring their history through this, um, this reenacted currency um and yeah uh it was uh, a nice project that really kind of coalesced the community around it for um a period of time and there was many questions asked as to um would we reenact it again or could it be a permanent thing 
um, some um, academics from uh, University of Limerick um, were asking me what was the will like to have something like this um, to, I suppose, bolster a, a more ecological sense of, of currency uh, in a city like Limerick. So I think I'll hand it back to you there, Fiona. Um, am I actually am I muted or not? No, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I think we're actually going to sort of open it up to questions, really. Um. Uh. Oh, I have one slide. Yeah. This is just this was just thinking about the 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 way that aesthetic actions operate as um you know in terms of the knowledge making and world banking project of the commons. Yeah, so I think we were going to pass it back to you, Leah, in terms of questions. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Fiona and Carol. That was that was great. Um if anyone has any questions, feel free to um yeah, feel free to unmute or pop it in the chat. Um I, yeah, I think I'll kick it off by asking you um, just to see that you've been kind of working on this topic since I think you said 2007, um, working on the topic of the Commons. I'm interested in how you started firstly and then also maybe how you've seen that conversation change and evolve. Yeah, um, it, you know, came to it slowly and, um, you know, it was looking at the idea of kind of um, solidarity networks in rural contexts. That was sort of where I started out um, maybe in about 2003, I started working on the ground up project um, and things kind of fell into place, I guess, as I was doing the, the, the research. Um, and I think in terms of how it's developed, it really is about that idea of the so of the social commons, first of all, understanding um, that the work can sit in that idea of, of enacting a social commons and, and also in some ways, well, contributing uh, and um, maybe temporarily initiating, if you like. Um, and then the other thing that's changed is, um, I think that the, the social movement of the commons has become much more visible, much more organized, and um, much more systematized, if you like. Um, but it retains that possibility that anyone can just, anyone can just start to enact a commons, you know. And the other thing I guess I started to understand was that the commons is very much about an infrastructure. It's the, it's in a way the infrastructure, however, however you interpret that in the sense of, you know, circuits of, of um, movement and use. And it's kind of how I'm thinking of, of infrastructures in contrast to, to institutions, which obviously can be much more kind of static. And um, does that answer your question? It's sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah, just thinking about it, it does seem to have kind of maybe um, become more part of the conversation, you kind of seeing it more now, so I was just wondering, yeah, from your point of view, having um, addressed it in 2007. Um, I think um, we have a question from Glenn. Glenn can you know, Hi, can you hear me? Glenn. Yeah. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Fiona. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> So, um, so something I'm, I'm interested in is your approach to the aesthetic, the aesthetics of the commons, and and as, I suppose I'm wondering, um, do you think that the that commoning itself is an aesthetic project, or something that we need to bring to it or form out of it? Because although you talk about an awful lot about structure and ecology, I also think it's an imaginary project like the formation of any community. And I'm wondering, are you looking at it in and of itself as an aesthetic project? Or is it something that we form out of the commons or bring to the commons? I'm just wondering what, what, what direction the aesthetic um, understanding or analysis is, is going. Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, um, it does. Uh, it does. I, I suppose, uh, like, you know, you know better than anybody that in order to answer that question, I've, I had to, like, 
dig down into what does I actually mean by aesthetics? What does that even mean? You know, and um, so when I said that this, you know, very simple phrase about about um, sensing and making sense, sense and sense making, in some respects, I I I think that I think that we you know, there is sense making happens in all kinds of ways, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's across the spectrum of life. We are, we are, do, we are making sense of what we sense. Um, and for me, in some respects, I think I'm thinking about aesthetics as just a more intense, more focused, more um, specific, uh, paying attention to that in some ways. And I think we, we do it differently. You know, we, depending on your medium or whatever, we, we kind of frame that perhaps in different ways. Um, that's how I've come to think about it. You know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not committed to the idea of my work always being art. You know, I'm, I'm much more interested in this idea of aesthetic work, you know, that it's sometimes it's art and sometimes it's, it looks like something else, you know, and, and I think that commenting, I think you, you're dead right. I think it is, it is in a way an aesthetic practice, certainly if you think about it in that sense of sense and sense making, and it doesn't have to be aestheticized. Yeah. And I don't think that's what I'm, I don't think that's what I'm, proposing i think it's more about like really paying attention critically to both the sensing and the sense making and that by doing that in fact it, it's like this idea of underpinning a system with very deliberately with a kind of um a set of aesthetics if you like i don't want to make it sound like i think that um you know i could do something on a huge structural level but i, I think those of us who are interested in this kind of work, I think we can contribute on these sort of macro levels. That's kind of what I was saying, but I do think those things join up. So I'm not inventing a commonist aesthetics, but I'm kind of looking out for what might that mean in terms of my practice. And one of the things it means to me anyway, is that need to move away from the visual because the visual is, it's problematic, you know, I mean, obviously you can't move away exclusively from the visual, but, you know, just trying to emphasize perhaps other ways of sense making. So that's kind of my project is trying to inquire into that, you know, so does that answer the question, Glenn? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I, I just think that it's the first time I've sort of seen you draw that out where it's, where, where there's this sense of, of the, of the imaginary within it, where, where the imaginary has a particular role in commoning itself outside of your practice, you know, that it's already happening within those structures um, and those ecologies of value that you're talking about. So I, I can I think it's interesting that both those are elements are running together in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, do you want to raise another question from Harry who's asking, how do you think that the internet has affected the idea of the commons? Well, um, of course, the, the, you know, the heady days of the, of the internet as a utopian project, um, uh, you, you know, it, it was clearly, I don't know if anybody knows this, but in the very, very beginning of the, of the internet, uh, there was something like, I don't know, 300 websites and like, 120 of them were artists websites you know <laughs> it was like artists really grasped the possibilities in this medium and of course the medium gets occupied we we know this but i think that um you know so much of the work that i do um connecting with you know these other projects all over the world is is about the internet you know it's it's um it's like what we're doing right now even if we weren't in a pandemic in fact one of the things about the pandemic has been i've been able to go to so many things like in new york and you know south africa and things i would never get to go to so i you know clearly that creates a, an opportunity for developing more kind of networks of solidarity and um which is which is essential, you know, in terms of thinking about the commons. But again, the commons is like a resource and a community who makes use of the resource and then some kind of, you know, way of caring for that so it's not exploited. And again, just to say that peer-to-peer -peer really thinking about this, you know, how do you stop um, open source production from just being co-opted by huge corporations, you know, just, just making off with the goods, if you like. So, so there's a lot of work being done in trying to protect peer-to-peer -peer production whilst keeping it open source, although that sounds contradictory. Um, Sheila wants to ask about your diagrams, which is something I was interested in too. I know that you kind of use a lot of graphs and diagrams in your work. Hi, hi yeah. Sheila. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. You know I'm a big fan of your diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, thank suppose, you. Um, it, moving on from what Glenn was asking you, and then how you answered that question, like I'm, I'm really interested in that idea about, um, I suppose, aesthetic as a as a form of of perception. You know, the the very old definition of what aesthetics are, but also really about the, like the knowledge processing. And I'm interested in your choice. You know, you, you talked about moving away from the visual. I'm interested in like the diagrammatic, I suppose, and that choice of, of representing the visual, but knowing also that that can be, you know, partly through graphic design that's sort of co-opted again and it becomes this nice shiny product that also kind of is reflective of what you just said about artists' websites. So I wonder if you if you would talk a little bit about your process and the sort of sense making and the visual and in your diagrams. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of aware of a contradiction, you know, where I talk about not not wanting to be kind of working in the register of the visual, but then, of course, the diagrams are, are visual, you know, artifacts. Um, the diagrammatic again, like you, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And it's um, the sense of, of a different you know, way, a different kind of language, if you like, for, for just communicating around, especially with socially engaged art, you know, how do you, how do you do that in ways that aren't sort of representational? You could just, it could just happen ephemerally and just let it go and, and never try to, to capture it. In fact, I, Glenn, I think you did a really interesting project like that once, but anyway, um, so the diagrammatic, it's, for me, it's just, uh, you know, you search around for things, don't you? And, and it just offers a really interesting language, I think, for, for um, it, it, again, it's like, I, I've been reading about the poetics of the diagram, like it, it, it doesn't represent, it sort of brings a meaning into being, which is, which is, um, you know, which is a, a it's a, it's a co-productive process of meaning making with the, the person who's interpreting the diagram I suppose um yeah I I don't I don't know if I have more to say on it Sheila I the the danger is of getting too slick of course I'm aware of that um so how does how does it be communicative without getting too slick and sort of informational graphics you know or, or infographics um I I don't think I've nailed that one but but that's that's the work in a way I, th I think does that does that does that answer what you were saying? <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions for the doctor? Um, Fiona, I'm also interested in how I suppose so much of your work is about working with the people, with groups of people and co-producers, as you mentioned. Um yeah do you have kind of ways of how, how you navigate that or how does that kind of happen yeah um i suppose i'm very committed to the idea of uh, works that are collectively authored you know if if that's even the right term um collectively produced co-produced work and um i've approached it in different ways over over the years and some more in successfully than others um and i guess you learn from your mistakes so with the laboratory i was you know i was building up to it really over four years um uh, prior to it and it it was about like trying to build a critical community first you know trying to build it in that way and have the work really come through dialogue i mean i had to you know i had a sense that what i wanted was an event space that would coincide with the centenary of the limerick soviet and that somehow there was a question about common interest, you know, mutualism and common interest. But beyond that, it, it emerged through the development of this critical community. And it seems to me that that is, that is the best way I have found to work, where I, I feel like it's a real, it's a real co-production. You know, it really, um, I have a role in it but it's not a it's not a it's not a, a primary role you know the work happens through everybody uh, making making it happen so i mean it's challenging you know with with socially engaged work there's, you always run the risk of of kind of extractivism you know extracting value from the work but um navigating it is i don't know it's it's uh it's it's case by case isn't it it's like an ethical practice you simply have to 
address it as it comes up and, and do your best to be mm. you know I liked um as part of the laboratory as well where you have a kind of going back to your sort of graphic you had a map which kind of had all of the co-producers and all of the links it was kind of a nice way to sort of display that um and we have another question about local and global from Ed Carroll. Hi Fiona. Hi Ed. So thanks so much. Very nice to hear this presentation on the Commons. It's really, uh, it's a real gift for a Friday evening. Uh, so th thanks for the energy that you, you put into it. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to ask on the Commons, because it has this sort of a link up between the local and the global, or this thing that you've quite often been interested in, this global. And uh, I, I, I just wonder, any, any, any insights around how, how to develop an ecology between the local and the global, where on the one hand, you're not just promoting your own local, or on the other hand, you're not just extracting the global back into your local, you know, and how do you create a more, uh, a relationship, as you call it, of solidarity? Mm, mm, yeah. Um, I suppose is that there's that notion of the translocal, isn't there? You know, where you it's like a peer, a peer network. And it, I maybe this goes back to an earlier question, like um when I was doing the rural uh, art project, uh, the Grand Art project, like the internet was absolutely essential for making connections um, internationally because the work wasn't taken very seriously in Ireland at the time. It was like the rural was really uninteresting and unfashionable, you know. Um, but um, I suppose, I mean, Ed, I think you're you're one of the one of the best people I know at doing doing that. You know, connect connecting up the dots between sort of uh, small local, if you like, small local projects, but actually turning them into when you connect, you constellate them, don't you? And you end up with something um, much much larger than you had realised was possible, if you like. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just. Um, I don't know that there's a formula for it, but I think going back to the peer to peer foundation, one of the things that's really interesting is they're trying to put some of those structures in place, you know, very practical um, structural things like, you know, contracts and systems and models that people can plug into or borrow from uh, open source um, materials. Um, and I guess it has to be a combination of those, doesn't it? It has to be a combination of the poetic, the local, plugging into these larger structures that are being created by people who are interested in those kinds of things. Um, yeah, just just trying to build the spilt solidarity as much as we can. It's it's difficult to do, but um, yeah, it's funny because you know the word you, you, you started off with was this idea of hope, you know, and in some ways there's always this sense in which one is left with this uh, possibility of hope. Uh, at the end of a process, but th there's no doubt. Um, it seems to me that in, in in terms of the, you know, this this idea of the commons, which in 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 some way, almost depends upon something of a practice site, and that, and that practice site somehow depends on some sort of a self management, and also a legal structure for it. You know, and for, for me, those elements I think that you mentioned are are, are really important. I suppose uh, coming back to Glenn's nice question, you know, it, it, I, I, I was going to ask probably a, a question around that because it comes up with the local and the global as well. Is, you know, what good is art and all of that? You know, and particularly socially, socially engaged art, which is so extractive into itself, you know, because it always has to define itself in its own brackets. And it's not really able to lose itself. You know, it's not really in, in, in some ways like a compost. You know, a compost is something that will grow something different from it. But somehow or other, there's this, this movement within socially engaged practice that always has to refine re, re itself in terms of itself. And that seems to me always to be a problem of, of a, a, a culture of solidarity at some level. I don't know what, what, what you think or whether you agree with that. It's just my opinion yeah no i totally do and maybe that's why i've started talking about my practice in terms of aesthetic work which is sometimes art you know and, and i think it's it's um it's kind of exactly that ed for me is the, the problem i had was around this, this the extraction of this surplus value you know and the even the ethics of that um 
But um, I guess what it, maybe what it comes back to, maybe what's important is the idea of creating a resource and, um, you know, sharing the resource and then managing that. Maybe, maybe it comes down to that. Maybe we don't have to think about it too much in terms like the like art, the frame of art is an incredible resource as well at times, you know, it can be really valuable and necessary, you know, in, in terms of the ways that other systems work. And so maybe if we, I came to think that maybe uh, approaching things as a resource to be used in the production of um, these forms of solidarity. And, you know, you have to kind of duck and dive between systems to some extent. And um, that's kind of how I've, how I've come to think about it, Ed, just in terms of like a, a positive approach. And also in terms of what art can do, I think art can do things. Uh, I think aesthetics, I've sort of been arguing that I think aesthetic work can really add to this ecosystem of value and also kind of frame a certain intensity around sense making the process of sense making within a within a political process like the commons um so yeah so that's where i've got to with it thank you thanks very much um i don't know if me wants to um speak but she has a comment here as well um I'm thinking as well as an idiom as a form of a commons or of making a commons around an idiom, perhaps thinking of the Limerick Soviet as being a type of idiom. Do you have a response to that one? Where is Neve? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm, have to. I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Hi. So I'm going to have to sort of ask you in what way you're using idiom. Sorry to put you on the spot, but. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, just want to start off saying thanks for the talk. It's really great to be here and see so many familiar faces from Limerick and beyond. Um, yeah, I guess I've been working a lot with with language and thinking about, I guess, forms of language. I mean, we spoke before about the commons and thinking about making language or making phrases or common phrases as a kind of idiom. Um, I'm not living in Ireland anymore and I find I say certain things and people look at me here and they're like, what the hell are you saying? Because I don't realize it's an Irish idiom. And then the way you're talking about a commons is kind of making a shared resource, which could be a language and actively working to continue that shared resource. Um, kind of makes me think of then number one is an idiom a form of a commons because you're working as a group to create that and I guess you can expand it and share it so teach a language continue a language and then also thinking of that is taking that same form of maybe a phrase or something that you're enabling together can that be something to then to start a commons um, or to begin like a practice of commoning use it as a um, maybe like a flag or like a, a yeah something to send to yourselves yeah. yeah, I think that's a lovely way of thinking about the aesthetics and aesthetics of the commons, you know, and, and I think in terms of the idioms, um, there's so much of language, isn't there, that that is extractive and capitalist driven and profit based, you know, I find myself using it all the time, you know, and I think oh, we do have to, we do have to have these new idioms in terms of maybe an idiom for the common. I think I'm hearing an echo. Is anybody not muted? I'm hearing myself back. It's very disconcerting. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I think that's a lovely way of putting it, Neve. It's it's like the sense of thinking of it in terms of language and, and the idioms. It's it's a lovely um, it's a lovely kind of aesthetic way of thinking about language. You know, uh, in terms of like sensing and sense making. Um, so yeah, we we had talked about it before, but it's like what, the way you said it now. It's like it's clearer to me, you know, what what you were, what you were, what you're saying with it, you know. Yeah, because I guess one thing I'm thinking of as well, like I think relating to the prior question about that scaling between the local and the global is, is there something about that that form of um, if you're trying to move away from an aesthetic, is there something in that idea of maybe an idiom that helps that? maybe that leap between the two scales. Yeah, again, that's lovely because it's like, you know, I was thinking about the choreographic and, you know, these the kind of thinking about that spacing and, you know, just one way of thinking about it. But if you think about it in terms of the idioms, the idioms that connect or, or you know, that become a shared resource in a way, shared mode of sense making. Um, that's a lovely way of thinking about how, you know, small places where the changes actually 
you know, are, are co-constructed, you know, at that tiny little level in a way, but it's also its language. So, right, it's, it's, it's every, you know, it's everywhere. Um, yeah, it's lovely. I hadn't thought about it like that, but I, I really like that. I really like that sort of approach and idea. Cool, thank you. <laughs> and does anyone else have any questions or anything they'd like to add? Um, is there, um, this is a clip here to hear, is it the common setup in Ireland, Fiona? The organization you mentioned. Oh, um, is there anything specifically set up? Um, mm. I mean, there are kind of commons-ish kinds of projects. It's obviously peer-to-peer -peer that the maker spaces, um, some of them are more commons oriented, some of them are a little bit more commercially oriented or whatever. There are there are things like the, what do you call that, Clock Jordan, the, the eco village, they're, they're doing a lot of commoning practices. And um, I think one of the ways to think about the commons at this point anyway is to think about commoning, you know, so we don't have to kind of, you know, have a fully defined commons because we, it's very hard to, it's very hard to have one of those anyway in terms of the systems that we occupy but I think in terms of practices of commoning I think there's a lot of that happening and I think artists do that a lot because it's like you, you know you have to do it to survive really so um I think there's a lot of practices of commoning going on and I think you know everybody says we aren't we all saying like let's not go back to the way it was before you know before the pandemic um mm. and I think maybe that's one of the things maybe the sense of solidarity and this this opportunities to share maybe it's just it's really clear how valuable those are I mean I feel more clear about it. um so I think I think anybody can get involved in any practice of commoning Peer-to-peer -peer is an international network. It's just available through the internet. There are talks and things, but everything that they do is available as open source. So it's it's accessible for anybody. So. Okay. Um, Glenn, I don't know, Glenn, if you want to unmute yourself again, you can pass back on. But, um, you kind of answered it there. Um, I'm okay. just wondering, um, within the context of the pandemic, uh, has it changed your understanding or, or or view of the concept? And I just put up a link to Bruno Latour, who uh, suggests that the pandemic is uh, like a, um, a sort of device for thinking about how quickly we might spread ideas, like that we could take that from it, you know, how quickly ideas can spread and how that can make some kind of connection. So I'm just, I was using that as a lead in to see how you um understand commoning within the context of social isolation mm. i i i mean i i have to say i i feel a bit odd saying this but i i found i found in a way with the with the pandemic and the lockdown i've had actually more access to things that i wouldn't have access to because i live in rural clare you know i don't get to go to anything really and like i said i've been to incredible things and I, f I think I feel that resource I feel the value of it and I think everybody who's been on the things I've been on has felt the same it's like this is an amazing thing that we're doing together this resource you know across other sides of the globe and yeah I, I think Bruno Latour is right I think and also when structures break down it's an opportunity to re-examine you know not putting the structures back you know but doing something else and I I think if if we if we can it takes a lot of work though doesn't it you know you have to be willing <laughs> like we'd all have to be willing to make those changes and um it's difficult you know because everybody gets caught up in in life but um i see a massive opportunity for us it's just can, can we actually put the work in to, to make it happen thank you um okay good stuff thanks for all of your questions everyone i think um we'll leave it there if you're happy to know um, so thank you so much, you and Kieran as well who spoke earlier. Um, just to remind you that this conversation um, is being recorded and will be available on Catalyst Direct website to watch back next week in case anyone missed anything. And the other online um, talks will be available there too. And obviously at the moment the gallery is closed, but um, there's some documentation of the exhibition on the website as well if you want to take a look. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again, Fiona.
Thanks a million, Leah. It's been great to be part of it. Oh, okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye.